So the church I go to asked me to build a manger stable. They gave me a $200 budget, and right here is $150 worth of cedar pickets and tree post things, treated lumber. Anyways, I don't know exactly what they're gonna use it for. I think it's just like a nativity scene with people. They gave me artistic license to do what I want. Let's see if I can make this work. My initial idea was to make this manger stable as authentic as possible. I really wanted to capture at least some of the characteristics and elements that would be reminiscent of what a manger might have really looked like when Jesus was born. So, like any obvious thinking woodworker would do, I called the city of Bethlehem Building and Safety Department in what is now Palestine to see if they could lend a helping hand. I spoke with a surly gentleman named Zamir. Being so far away and not in person made it difficult to impose my undeniable charm, but I figured I'd take a crack at Zamir. I said, Zamir, my friend, I'm building a manger stable for our live nativity at my local church across the pond here in California. And I was hoping you could help me with obtaining some of the building codes in and around 0 AD. Maybe even some original photos, blueprints, or mock-ups of a manger-like structures during that time. After a bit of silence, he said, huh? I said, yeah, yeah, I just need you to help a brother out. I don't have to have the exact year of 0 AD, but in and around that time, within about 30 years. Dust off some cuneiform tablets or unwind some papyrus scrolls. I'm sure you have to have at least something I could work with. Then the phone went dead. I don't know. So without his help, I just kind of winged it. I went ahead and used some cedar planks and some tree stakes and made the best of it. I started off by cutting the cedar pickets in half, except for the last two inches. So I removed those because they're 45 at the end. This is the part where I focused mainly on just the side walls. I wasn't gonna worry about the top until later. Each of the sides that I build are going to be not the same. So the right side is gonna be higher than the left side because I'm kind of going for an asymmetrical A-frame. Why you ask? Well, why not? Anyone can build an A-frame, but who can build an asymmetrical A-frame? I thought it'd be cool and unique. Connecting square ends to a round post seems challenging, but I knew my pocket hole jig workstation would be perfect for this. So pocket holes it was. And if you want to check out my build on that, click on the video above. There's a link right there. The tree stakes are two and a quarter inches thick and the cedar pickets are three quarter of an inches thick. Wow, look at that. That works out just perfect. That was a bit of a happy accident that I'd like to take full credit for. So now when I use the two inch coarse thread pocket hole screws, they will line up perfectly with the center of that stake. It was just a matter of always having a cedar picket underneath the cedar picket I was screwing into the stake. Just kind of shift them around here and there. Putting together these side walls of the manger stable was quite simple and easy. Fortunately, my workbench was just wide enough to accommodate this build. Once I secured that first stake, it was very simple by using my clamps to secure the second stake and drive those pocket holes in again. I used my Bessie 50 inch bar clamps and DeWalt 12 inch trigger clamps to get the job done. Anything you see me use in this build, I'll leave a link in the description so you can click on it and buy it yourself. Of course, with only one wall, this manger stable wouldn't stand up for long. So I repeated the same exact process and made a second wall. Although the second wall was a little shorter than the first wall. Now, no thanks to Zamir. This is where things get a little tricky. I laid my side walls on the ground and tried to get an idea of what angles I wanted to use, what pieces, and then I found, well, that one was too small and okay. Okay, that, yeah, that one's, that one's too big. Okay, and yeah, that one, that's that's gonna be the right one right there. That looks pretty good, I think, don't you? <laughs> okay, okay, anyways. I used a digital protractor to kind of find the right angles and then take those numbers and transfer it onto the post where I cut the angles at. And I just kind of went for what looked the best and that's how I did it. For the first two cuts, I used my jigsaw, but this was a bad idea. I highly recommend using any kind of handsaw for these kinds of cuts on the post. So from here on out, I use my Japanese pull saw for the rest of these cuts. I wanted the roof post to sit in a bit of a groove, so I just cut at an angle 
to give it a bit of a slot so it could sit in. It's not fine woodworking by any means, but for this particular application, it's just a set piece facade. It'll work. Once I had the final dimension of the tree stakes, I was then able to take a piece and fill in that extra last space so that the side walls were complete. Of course, the tip of the A-frame needed to fit just so, and I find that using a white colored pencil is great when marking on dark colored wood. We've now reached the point of the video where I am building the roof. Here you see lots of clips of me doing this and that, sawing and screwing, cutting. Now, it's right about this point where I realize I have made a grave error and I'm trying to figure out how to fix it. So let me explain things to you right here. Let me show you what I did wrong and let me show you what I'm gonna do to fix it. These are the side walls. I bought these in six foot lengths and I cut them in half, wasted two inches, and these are 35 inch pieces. This is the roof. These pieces are 36 inches long. I basically cut them in half and wasted nothing. Now I want a staggered look because it's a roof, but a roof need, needs a reveal like this where the planks will stick out past this post. In order for these posts to line up with these posts, these boards need to be shorter than these boards, not by one inch, but a lot more. So here's what I'm gonna do to fix it. I'm gonna take each of these pieces and I'm going to remove all of the pocket holes. I'm gonna take a straight edge along here and with my circular saw, I'm gonna cut off four and a half inches so I get this kind of reveal off this front post of the roof. Then I'm going to reattach all of these with the pocket holes and then it should look good. So that's what I'm gonna do. And just like that, they're a little more narrow. Took a little work, but hey, what do you know? Once I solved that problem, things got a little bit easier. All I had to do was make sure that all of my tree posts all lined up from the walls to the roof. And then I just had to make sure that the roof planks were all staggered evenly. I used my ruler just to make sure everything was looking pretty good. Now it's time to start putting things together, and here's where it really starts to look like something. I fastened all of the pieces together using three and a half inch construction screws. I drilled pilot holes for all the screws, that way I wouldn't split the wood. And if you look really closely, you can see the moisture from the wood bubble up as I'm drilling into those cedar wood planks. And in the spirit of Christmas cheer, my good neighbor Vern came on over to help me lift this monstrosity off the ground so I could secure the tippy top of the roof. Vern suggested that I put a back wall, that way I could get more stability in the structure, which I thought was a really good idea. Fortunately, I had some scrap laying around from a previous build and some 2x4s that I split down the middle so that I could make somewhat of a back. Not a full back, but just enough to give it support and give it a little bit more dimension. I probably put way too many screws in these horizontal pieces. It wasn't until later I realized I can take these 2x4s and connect it so it all becomes one stabilized piece. Fortunately, Jonas was around to push on the other side to help me out a little bit. He's handy that way. But just before putting on that back wall, I took a step back and realized, you know, something is missing. There's something I need to add. I'm not sure what this part is called, but if you know, leave a comment in the comment section. Is it the front fascia? Not quite sure. But either way, I figured it would add support and just make it look better. I'd have to say that this part of the build was my very favorite. I got to use my handsaw, I also got to use my rigid oscillating spindle sander and really be a little more detail oriented. Now I understand this whole project, it's just a set piece. It just has to look good enough from far away really. It doesn't have to be structurally sound, it doesn't have to last long, it doesn't have to hold up to the wind or the rain. Well, it is outdoor wood though, so it'll do pretty good outside. And if you're in the Christmas spirit this year and have that feeling of wanting to give and give this video a like. And by the way, hit that subscribe button, ring the bell for notifications, come back again. I got plenty of more content coming out for you. This manger stable was built so it could help each and every one of us remember the birth of Christ, the everlasting contribution of Mary and Joseph as his earthly parents, of course the gospel and church that Christ established here on earth, 
and his atoning sacrifice for all of us. I really appreciate the opportunity to contribute to our church's Christmas gathering and live nativity, and I hope all of my viewers and subscribers have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. After we had finished setting up the manger stable for the Christmas party, the outdoor Christmas party that is, uh, someone had told me that we had nothing to put baby Jesus in, which is just a baby doll. So my daughter Taya and I went home real quick and whipped together a little something something for baby Jesus.